Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week, your weekly rundown of all things space news. And wow, what a week. As always, Starship has seen big progress with our first look at Starship V2 and assembly of Tower 2 now well underway. And oh my, lots of mishappenings across the board. Boeing Starliner astronauts are still stuck on the ISS. Hyperbola 1 suffered a launch failure. Falcon 9 suffered a second stage engine rud after a LOX leak and Ariane 6's maiden flight suffered a failure that precluded third relight of its Vinci upper stage, losing two of its payloads. In fact, only one out of the four orbital launches last week was a complete success. Furthermore, NASA's $4.25 billion Europa Clipper spacecraft now looks like it may not be able to launch this year following discovery that some of its key components won't stand up to Jupiter's harsh radiation levels. All of this and so much more, so sit back and enjoy. Arise, ye mighty Starship V2. Sorry, I, I don't know what that was. But yes, what you're watching right now isn't actually Starship V2, it's V1. Elon has shared with us before that the forward flaps will change a lot in upcoming versions of Starship, becoming smaller and more leeward. And I'm not gonna lie, this kind of made me a bit worried. This was Eric's interpretation of what a Starship with smaller and more leeward upper flaps would look like, and yeah, it's uh... It's a bit cursed. Luckily, reality paints a better picture. Lab Padre posted a side-by-side -side comparison of an old Starship V1 nose cone versus a newly spotted V2 nose. And yep, the flaps are certainly smaller and more leeward, but I think I like it. Definitely looks sleek. I'm excited to see how it'll look when incorporated into a full vehicle. Maybe it'll look like this. This is a quick and dirty two minute Photoshop jobby by me. Obviously the aft flaps and fuselage are Starship V1, so it probably won't look exactly like this, but hey, helps visualize the new nose cone maybe? Hey, you know what? Hey, just wait a second. As for the rest of the new V2 vehicle, we saw what looks like its payload section being moved into Mega Bay 2. See that heat shielding there. There are also some bare metal segments being moved into the bay. Potentially, these will be used in a prototype vehicle only, given the lack of tile work. But if you have any other suggestions, then do leave them in the comments below. We've continued seeing the arrival of more tower segments for launch and catch tower 2 at Boca Chica, like this one arriving here, and the tower itself is beginning to rise. The first module was lifted onto the base of the tower last Thursday, and Lab Padre captured this shot of workers bolting the structure in place. Over at the main launch tower, the biggest event to take place last week was the arrival of Booster 12, the booster that will be used in Starship's fifth integrated flight test, and will hopefully perform the first ever successful landing within the arms of the chopsticks. It made its journey down the highway before being carefully raised and placed into the orbital launch pad. SpaceX then wasted no time at all in putting the booster through testing. Things started with the loading of cryogenics, as evidenced by the frost formation on the booster's fuselage, and we also saw some grid fin testing too. Stage 0 was put through its paces as well, with ship quick disconnect arm retraction tests. The main event though was yet to come. On Friday, the booster was partially fueled, and we saw the activation of the FireX suppression system on the pad, and then there it is, a spin prime test of the Raptor engines. This is the first time actually that we've had a spin prime test of a super heavy booster since Booster 9, and no, this wasn't an aborted static fire attempt. If SpaceX were planning on the engines igniting, they would have seen water deluge system activation, so spin prime was always the plan. Spin prime is basically the same as a static fire, except, as the name might suggest, the engines are only spun up and no ignition takes place. We can expect to see static fire on the cards for the next Super Heavy test though. Booster 12's companion vehicle, Ship 30, is still undergoing heat shield replacement in the high bay, but looking at these latest images from NASA spaceflight, work is definitely looking like it's nearing completion, with a largely finished heat shield behind all that scaffolding. The 8th of July was a big day for Turkey, as on this day, a SpaceX Falcon 9 carried the Turksat 6A communication satellite to geosynchronous Earth orbit from Cape Canaveral, marking the first launch of a domestically produced Turkish satellite. 
While Turkey has several previously launched payloads to its name already, they were always built with much of the production outsourced to companies like Airbus Defence and Space, who, for example, built the Turksat 5A and 5B. The Turksat 6A, though, was built entirely locally in Turkey itself, and the Falcon 2nd stage successfully delivered it to orbit, where it'll serve as a communication satellite in support of both commercial and government purposes. Falcon 9's first stage landed on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean, completing its 15th overall mission. And that was the only successful space mission of the week, unfortunately. Well, okay, maybe that's worded slightly contentiously. The other Falcon 9 launch we saw was only a partial failure, as was the Ariane 6 maiden flight. Since we're already on the subject of Falcon 9, we'll talk about this one first. On the 11th of July, the rocket launched from the Vandenberg Space Force Station, carrying 20 Starlink satellites to orbit. Now, the first stage operated well, and after separating from the upper stage, it made a successful boost back and landing burn, touching down on the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship in the Pacific, completing its 19th overall flight. The second stage, however, didn't fare quite so well. SpaceX's official statement reads that Falcon 9's second stage performed its first burn nominally, however a liquid oxygen leak developed on the second stage. After a planned relight of the upper stage engine to raise perigee, the Merlin vacuum engine experienced an anomaly and was unable to complete its second burn. Although the stage did survive and still deployed the satellite, it didn't successfully circularize its orbit, leaving the satellite in an eccentric orbit with a very low perigee, less than half the expected perigee altitude. They went on to state that the satellites were left in an enormously high drag environment. As such, the satellites will re-enter Earth's atmosphere and fully demise. They don't pose a threat to other satellites in orbit or to public safety. So yes, a shame, but spaceflight is enormously challenging and anomalies are inevitable going to happen. SpaceX to date have completed 364 successful Falcon launches, with Falcon being arguably the most reliable launch vehicle in the world. Interestingly, the FAA has made the decision to ground Falcon 9 while they work with SpaceX to investigate the issue, and so we may have some quieter weeks ahead of us for launch news, given that Falcon 9 won't be launching for the foreseeable future, at least until this investigation concludes. Europe is so back. After the retirement of the Ariane 5, Europe has been left without a primary launch vehicle, but not anymore, as, after a few delays, the Ariane 6 is now flying, with its maiden flight taking place last week on the 9th of July. The rocket successfully lifted off from the French Guiana Space Center in South America, carrying a mass simulator payload, as well as a number of CubeSats and experimental rideshare payloads. The launch to orbit was a success, and yeah, check out this shot of the core falling away there. Amazing. And the upper stage performed a successful second burn to release the CubeSat payloads. However, in the final phase of the mission, the upper stage was to perform a third burn to deorbit itself and deploy two experimental re-entry capsules. But this unfortunately didn't happen due to a failure in the auxiliary propulsion system and so deorbit didn't take place. So only a somewhat minor failure and whichever way you look at things, this was certainly more successful than the maiden flight of Ariane 5. And it was definitely more successful than last week's Hyperbola 1 launch. Yes, this is the only video we have of this. <laughs> the solid-fueled rocket blasted off on the 10th of July, carrying three weather satellites, and while the launch appeared to go well, with nothing going wrong in the only footage we have of the flight right now, Chinese authorities have stated that there was an unspecified anomaly with the rocket's fourth stage that precluded low-Earth orbit insertion, and the mission was unfortunately lost. This isn't a great track record for the Hyperbola 1 at this stage, built by private company iSpace, which has only had three successful launches compared with four unsuccessful ones. NASA still don't know when Butch and Sonny, the crew of Boeing Starliner, will be able to return to Earth after continuing to refuse authorization to return to Earth in a non-emergency situation. In a press conference held last Wednesday, NASA affirmed that the issues lie with helium leaks and thruster anomalies, and engineers are still looking into what caused them. Boeing's vice president stated that there were a number of specific actions identified from both the helium and the thruster anomalies, a little bit over 30, of which more than half are closed at the moment. On the helium leak, they hope to bring that into the Starliner mission management team for final resolution later this week. Currently, Starliner is rated to leave the ISS in case of an emergency only, with all but one of its 28 RCS thrusters clear for use during the departure and deorbit burns. 
What was able to leave the ISS last week was Northrop Grumman's 20th commercial Cygnus cargo spacecraft, which was released from the station's robotic arm last Friday. It delivered roughly 4 metric tons of cargo to the station when it arrived on the 1st of February this year, and carried away just over 3.3 tons of waste from the station, to be destroyed during its fiery re-entry into Earth's atmosphere. The docking port it left behind will be reoccupied by another Cygnus spacecraft currently scheduled to arrive in August. NASA hopes to launch the very exciting Europa Clipper mission this October, but sadly it may miss its three-week launch window after some issues have been discovered with its transistors. These are vital to the spacecraft's function and have been specially radiation hardened to withstand the massive radiation levels in the Jupiter system, the most intense radiation environment in the solar system. However, new tests have found that some of the transistors are not actually as resilient as they need to be, and that they are likely to fail when near Jupiter. Teams are working on further analysis of the suspect transistors, and NASA is evaluating options for the spacecraft. I really hope a solution is found and it does launch on time. Europa Clipper is the mission that I am the most excited for this decade. If you're new here, then Europa is the smallest of Jupiter's four Galilean moons, the sixth largest in the solar system, and it's a super interesting place because it has a water ocean beneath its icy surface, which could conceivably harbour life. Europa Clipper is a mission to investigate just this. It's named so because it'll study Europa extensively, but not from Europa orbit. You see, Jupiter's magnetosphere means that Europa orbit has very, very high radiation, which would kill a spacecraft in Europa orbit. So instead, the satellite will clip past Europa on 44 close flybys from a highly elliptical orbit around Jupiter. Lown Aerospace was back in action again last week, I decided to take a break from hectic launches and take the time to clean up my rather cluttered low curb in orbit with a specialised SSTO after discovering that there were several spend stages left up there. Must be the European in me or something. <laughs> it was a pretty fun mission in my opinion and it should be one of the clickable cards on screen right now for you to check out if you haven't seen it already. But that's it from me and today's episode of Space This Week. Patreon and channel members who make all of this content possible are on the left there. I do hope you enjoyed this video and I'll catch you at the weekend for more epic gamer space frog content. Goodbye.